survive. The kids get downstairs and get started. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we love and honor you. We thank you for uh, the word, the word that become life and become flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you that your word is powerful, <clears throat> sharper than any two-edged sword, God, that it sees deep within, our, within us, God, within the very intentions of our heart. Father, we know that your word is powerful, but only when it's combined with your spirit. But I pray that your word, combined with your spirit, pierce our hearts and souls. God, bringing us a little closer to you. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to read a, a couple of verses to start off with to sort of set up the sermon. Uh, revival of deliverance is what we're going to be talking about this morning. I, uh, On my third sermon for the week, I had one in John 5 talking about the importance of the deity of Jesus. And then I was going to do one on uh, healing. And is it God's will to always heal? Why, why, as Christians, if we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, why some of us are still sick and why? And I may do that one next week, I'm not sure. But as I began to pray, and I started my fast on Monday, and as I began to pray, the Lord really dropped this word in my heart. And if I've ever come before you confidently before, and I am a man that is confident that he hears from the Lord as it pertains to his sermon, I am that much more confident concerning what I believe the Lord not only has for us, but other people that may hear this sermon online. Habakkuk 2 2 and 3, and I'll be jumping from the New Living Translation to the New King James Version. And if you need these notes, uh, let me know. I'll email them to you. Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3 in the NLT reads, Write my answer plainly on tablets so that the runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled if it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place and will not be delayed. <laughs> Today I want to talk about the vision that I believe the Lord has given me for our local church and the Christian movement in our nation. We are seeing a drastic shift in some of our churches in the country. The Spirit has begun to, to uproot and rile certain preachers up. 1 Corinthians 2 and 10 said, These things happen to them as an example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Now, let me tell you something. The last day started at Pentecost, but we are living in the last of the last days. And we're going to talk about movements in the last 120 years, 130 years in the church, and how we can see a systematic order of revivals moving from one area to the other area and what we are at the beginning of. Israel was a type and shadow of the church today. So we can look at their, the nation of Israel's, we can look at their failures and successes and get wisdom in how we operate as a church, both locally and collectively. One of the things, you know, I've been a big part of is trying to fellowship with other churches in the community. I think it's a shame that we got friends and, and, and what brothers and sisters in Christ that we never fellowship with that are in the same community. But I want to go to Judges and talk about an unlikely warrior. A person that just would not have been chosen. One that had a little opinion of himself and, and, and rightfully so. But let's go to Judges, the sixth chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. Then Israelite did evil in the Lord's sight. 
You know, you ever read the Old Testament and you just like, it seems like they would have figured it out by now. I mean, one yeah. time after another after another, you know, they were powerless. Listen, they were powerless over their propensity to sin because the Holy Spirit was falling on particular ones and was not residing in them. Without the Holy Spirit residing in you, you do not have the power to consistently do right. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were cruel that the Israelites made, they were so cruel that they made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian and Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel. Later on, you read about Amalek. What did God do? God destroyed every one of them because of the evil that was done here. we got to be careful when we rise up against God's people. And the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land, destroying the crops as far as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. How many people seen the locust swarms last year in the Middle East? You literally, the sky would become dark as the locusts would come through. I want you to imagine men, men for, with, with evil intentions coming into your neighborhood looking to destroy everything that you own. Take everything. They arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. When you look at these locusts, when they get through, there's nothing left. In 1989, we had a hurricane go through the Virgin Islands. The thing about a hurricane is when it's out at sea, it can move at 200 miles an hour. As soon as it hits the ground, it begins to slow down. When you got a, a, a couple of little islands in the middle of the Gulf Coast, what happens? That hurricane doesn't slow down. I was working for Chicago Bridge and Iron at the time, and after Hugo went through and tore up the oil refinery, we had to go down and fix it. Let me tell you, what was not on the island? There were not any insects on the island because the 200 mile an hour wind stripped them away. It looked like King Kong had walked across tin cans with those big, thick oil tanks just collapsed in. Crude oil all over the island. Island. There were no birds singing because the wind had swept it away. This is what we see when we see the Midianites coming against Israel. Against Israel. Let me tell you, this is what we see when we look at the condition of today's church as darkness has come in and exacted its will. But God has some people that are tired of bowing to darkness. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites and Israelites cried out to God, the Lord, for help. You know what? I'm excited about uh, Maryland's instantaneous healing. I'm not excited that it is uncommon. I'm excited about the 40 or 50 folks that have come into this church in the last 50 years and we've cast demons out of them. I'm excited about, but I'm not excited that it's only been 40. I believe God has got a revival coming that's going to start in churches like this and started last year in churches all over the country raising up an uncommon army. When they cried for their heart, Lord because of Midian, they, they, you know, you, you never pray like you pray when you're in trouble. Mm. Right? You, you, we, what we need to do is we need to ask God for the compassion to pray like that for our community when the child down the road takes his life and we don't know that child. We need to be broken. Amen. We need to be broken for the number of people in our area that are overdosing and dying and the ones that God has pulled out of that and given you another chance, you need to take up the banner of God and raise it high and let people know that you, that the devil meant to kill you, but God turned it for good. Amen. Amen. 
They cried out, because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of, out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all that oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. And y'all can relate. I remember that encounter at 10 when I was slain in the spirit and the Lord called me preacher. And I remember getting kicked out of the army for continuous misconduct. I remember the money that I made and I remember the feds showing up at my house and every time an event like that happened, I also remember the Lord trying to correct me and trying to nudge me, trying to talk to me, trying to turn me back around. But I just persisted in doing wrong until the Lord finally got to the point that he broke me. The Lord is breaking Israel, Israel right here. They're having to live in the cave. They're having to live in the caves and in the mountains. They're having to hide from this army that was hell bent on their destruction. The Midianites represent the realm of darkness today. Whether you know it, believe it, understand it or not, there is a realm of spiritual beings that live outside, that live in another realm outside of what we can see naturally. They're real. The devil's real. He's really got minions and he's hell bent on stealing, killing, and destroying everything in your life. The church represents Israel in its sin as compromise. The church today is caught up in the idea of materialism and I have no problem with a God. I have no problem with you being blessed with an abundance, but when you begin to worship the abundance instead of worshiping God, when you begin to seek the blessings instead of seeking the blessings, blessings you have moved from worship to idolatry, as we'll see in a second. And we have those that choose tradition over the presence of God. Jesus confronted the religious leaders of his day as, as they condemned him for healing on the Sabbath. I mean, you have people that a man afflicted for 39, 38 years, Jesus heals him on the Sabbath. A miracle. He was lame. Jesus told him to take up your bed and walk. And they got mad at him. A lady with an infirmity bent over because of demon. Yes, let me tell you, some of your health problems are demons. We got to stop praying for healing and we got to stop casting out demons of infirmities. I'm just a dumb old country boy determined to believe it if it's in the Word of God. I don't care what science says. I don't care what the doctor says. I believe that the blood still flows and it's still able to heal. Amen. And I believe we deal with demons a lot more than we want to admit. Amen. They condemned him for healing on the Sabbath, explaining to Jesus that they would have, rather have their traditions than the presence of God. Who was Jesus? He was God born on this earth. They're looking at the Son of God, the prophesied Messiah, and they would rather have their extra Laws. God never intended for the Sabbath to be like they said it was. He called them a hypocrite. He said, you feed your donkeys. You feed your mules. You feed your oxens on. And I come over here and heal this woman and heal this man. And somehow, now you're upset at me. All you're doing is you're evil. Just ugly heart has revealed itself. So what has darkness stolen from us? What is darkness like the Midianite horde stole their crops and their livestock, their ability to eat. Darkness has stole something from the church today. Darkness has stole the power of God. The power of God to heal. The power of God that brings signs and wonders. The power of God that brings deliverance. The power of God that draws someone to true salvation. Let's look at how this affects these demons affect us and our other generations in Matthew 12, 43 through 45 in the NLT. 
When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. So what we're talking about is like we've seen here. People get delivered from demons. They're, 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 they're fresh. They're empty. That demon's coming back around. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be in this wicked generation. Concentrate on the word generation. So many years I looked at that as being an individual thing. This is not talking as much about an individual thing as it is a family thing. I told you a hundred times we deal with the consequences of three sin. I deal with my personal sin. I deal with generational sins. And I deal with the sins of society. Societal sins affect us. It plainly says that it rains upon the just and the unjust. Because this country for a long time sought God, but what are they doing now? They're disregarding God. And we're seeing the blessings of this nation fall apart. Why? Because we have chosen that what is politically correct over what is the absolute truth of God. Amen. Yes. One of the applications is for individuals. I had a young lady coming this weekend. She said, well, Ron, you know, I've been clean since August 2021. And if you're listening right now, young lady, you should be here this morning because I promise you what you're dealing with is only going to get worse. I love you. She said, but for the last few months, things are visiting me in the night. There's things running around my room. I'm waking up in the middle of the night and sweating in terrors. I'm being tormented by demons. I said, yeah, I just got through reading that scripture. I said, yeah, of course, we got them out of you one time and you didn't fill the house back up, so they're coming back. Let me ask you this question. We can take care of them again, but are you ready to truly repent and commit your life to God? Amen. There's too many people come. They get free. They get free and they're, they're, they're on free and they do nothing for God. When you get free, it's time. God didn't pull you out of a ditch so you can stand over here and be on the sidelines. God pulled you out of the ditch to pull other people out of the ditch. Amen. But the main point is this is generations who refuse to repent and just continue in their sin. They begin to attract more and more detestable demons. To who? Their children? Their grandchildren? and their great-grandchildren. Are you listening to me? When God delivers you and you're a, a dad, listen, all the weight is on the daddy. All the weight is on us fathers. We are the priests, the protectors, the providers, and the prophets of our home. There's no excuse. When I married Marilyn, I married her daughters. When she married me, she married my kids. We are now a family. I'm to hold them accountable and she's to hold me accountable. People say our society went sideways when we took prayer out of school. What we have, what we have today started when we took prayer out of the home. And we made, and we had the idea that serving the Lord is a weekly trip to the church house if even that. You, you walk down the road here and you ask Eight out of ten people, if they're a Christian, they're going to say yes. But seven to eight out of those are going to tell you they're not born again. That's how little people know about the Word of God. You cannot truly be a follower of Christ on your way to heaven if you have not been born again. Read John the third chapter. Amen. What happens is, your father's prescription pill problem becomes your kid's fentanyl problem. How many times have we seen generations of addiction? What used to be just a, a Budweiser every now and then, what used to be a little moonshine, three generations from now, the kids are laying in the floor. We're having to hit them with five, six, seven things on Narcan to give them another chance at life. But they're so caught, they're so demonized, they're so messed up Amen. that they go right back. To 
the shooting fentanyl once again. Why? Because Exodus 20 and 5 tells us you must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other God. You say, well, Ron, I, I don't... Man, I'm Jesus. That's the only one I worship. I'm going to show you what you worship here in a minute. We're going to evaluate ourselves and see what we worship. Let me tell you what you worship. You worship what you spend your money on. You worship what you spend your time doing. You worship what you dedicate your talent to. If that time and your, and your resources are not invested to God and, and God beyond anything else, you, you, you say, well, Ron, i got to work. Hey, man, you got to work. Do you take it? Is God with you on the workplace? Amen. Is He there? Then you, 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 you got a God. You got a little G God. You got Baal and Asherah that we're going to talk about in a second. I lay the sin of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Man, I'm guilty. I worship money. I worship sex. I worship success. I worship everything for the first 39 years of my life. I thought I was successful. I thought I was doing good. I acknowledged God, but He wasn't my God. That Oxycontin was my God. That $30,000 a month, that was my God. That million dollars in the bank was my God. The 100 employees that I had that made me feel good about myself, that was my God. And I served them until God ripped it all away from me, loved me enough to to send me to a federal prison for me to remember the, that my mama was not going to stop praying until I repented. Amen. Idolatry looks a lot different in the New Testament than it does the Old. So what is idolatry in the New Testament? Colossians 3, 5 and 8. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality. Man, it, it's just, I mean, come on. I mean, come on, man. We got, uh, we, got, uh, we got sexually explicit books in our elementary schools. I mean, I'm not kids it's bad. It is it's beyond thought. A couple years ago, we had a, a man call himself a woman, and they let him beat all the women swimming records. It's bad. And it's just progressively getting worse. But we're seeing abounds. Much more does grace. The darker they get, the lighter I get. I'm able to shine in the midst of this mess. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetous, which is idolatry. Covetous is idolatry. Greed is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Let me tell you, the wrath of God is coming. The final way, the final revival of the end days is going to be a revival brought about as men's hearts fail them because the wrath of God being poured out on this evil world. And these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. The United States has become too busy for God. Too busy for God. Somehow we have come to the conclusion that attending church occasionally or maybe not even at all encompasses all of our Christian duties. We traded the miracles, the presence of God, the gifts of the Spirit, deliverance. We traded those things. We traded the presence of God for a pickup truck and a nice house. They got to work 30 hours a week overtime in order to maintain. And when something needs to be done at the church, I'm too busy being in debt to pray. To, to, to serve God. I can't, I can't do anything. I'm bound, don't you know? Listen, don't you know? The Bible says plainly that the, the, the warrior is in slavery to the lender. Our lives, my life was consumed with the desire for stuff. I like stuff. I, I like stuff. But when I begin to like stuff more than I do God, when I begin to neglect my, my calling, my, when my passion is towards stuff, when my desire is towards stuff, when, when, when that happens there, I'm, com I'm coveting, I'm, I'm greedy, I am worshiping the God of this world. According to Colossians, the idolatry of the last days, the church is coveting. 
because we won't stuff our kids suffer from demonic strongholds in our family lines. And soon we will see the final revival, the revival set in motion by the fear of God as he pours out his wrath on the world. If you really want to know what you worship, keep a log of what you spend your time, talent, and money on. Let's go to Acts 2, 17 and 3. Let's just skip over that one. That says in the last days that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. If you follow the history of the Pentecostal movement in the last 20 years, you'll see four seemingly moves of God. We have the original outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Um, and when he did, man, old, old Peter, the coward, the one that denied Jesus, I want you to think about that. The Holy Ghost fell. Now all of these disciples, all these apostles were running to hide, hiding behind locked doors. And then they had an encounter with the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden they become willing to lay their life down. What we need in the church in America is an outpouring of the good old fashioned Holy Ghost. Amen. And then the Catholic Church got involved in the Holy Ghost got pushed to the side for tradition. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit ain't going to reside when tradition is important. Man, I like tradition. I like number 333 in the blue hymnal. I ain't figured out the black hymnal yet. I like he set me free, number 235. I like that he's God on the mountain. I like those old songs. But let me tell you, when those old songs hold me in bondage, that tradition is going to rip the power of God from a church. Revival broke out at the turn of the century. The Zuzu Street, the Welsh Revival, and Revival in the North Carolina all within 10 years of each other. All of a sudden, some folks got to praying. The Reformation had happened. The Protestant Reformation happened, and some people got close to God. John Wesley writes, the founder of the Methodist Church, how he would pray all night long and cry and weep before the Lord. You see these ancient fathers, they got, they got close to God. Miracles started happening. People like Billy Sunday could preach to 2,000 people without a microphone. How? Because the power of God enabled him to do so. Starting in the late 40s, uh, we see a sweeping of the Holy Spirit across the world. And people begin to get healed. I got a real good friend. He's in his 70s. Uh, Ernest Angeli. Anybody remember Ernest Angeli? Mm -hmm. now, he's real. I don't care what you say. This guy, I know him. He's a good friend. One leg's about three inches shorter than the other. He had on a brace. He's about seven years old. That leg grew that day. Brother Roy Cordell, the associate pastor uh, of Dilworth Church of God. But we see people. It started with the healing then. You, you, and I know we got a lot of weird prophets today that are prophesying out of the evil intentions of their heart, but we have seen real prophecies come true in the 70s. And today, we are seeing in the U.S. people all over our country being delivered from demonic influence. Why now? Why are we dealing with demons now at an unprecedented level? Why are so many people afflicted and tormented in their minds by demons and unclean spirits? This isn't new. If you talk to these missionaries, let me tell you what they'll tell you. They've been dealing with de demons over in different countries their entire life. You go to India and begin to preach Jesus where they serve three million different gods. Let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to run into some demons. See, the societal sin opens us up to be progressively influenced by the demonic influence. And as this country is getting further away from God, demons are being released because it is our sin that gives the demon the power. It is our sin that gives the demons the legal right to come in and consume and to control. But I promise you this, you're created in the image and the likeness of God and you never have free will removed. You can't become reprobate, but let me tell you, you still got free will. And the final move of God will be the wrath of God, bringing the fear of the Lord to the forefront. How long is this deliverance revival that we're at the beginning of going to last? I don't know. But Luke 21, 26 says, Men's hearts fell in them for the fear of expectation of those things which are coming to the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The power of the spiritual realm will be shaken. How about men falling dead of a heart attack? 
Falling dead. That sounds like the fear of God. Let's think about the condition of the American church in the last five or 15 years. COVID shut down our churches. We shut down. It was a blessing to us. All of a sudden, we started getting four and 5,000 people watching our, uh, our, our YouTube channel and, and our Facebook. Not that many now. Multiple well-known pastors have been caught in affairs. Robbie Zacharias, he's a, an, uh, he, he owned massage parlors. The Methodist Church affirms gay marriage and gay ministers. And listen, I'm all for your right to do whatever you want to do. But right is right and wrong is wrong. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. If the Bible says it's sin, it's sin. That includes gluttony. That includes gossiping. That includes lying. That includes anything that's not a faith. That includes racism. It includes anything that the Bible says is sin is sin. Amen. Drag shows in local churches. Now, how do we get this far away? I'm telling you because we're seeing the Bible come true. There'll be GTQ phenomenon when the laws passed in 2016. Graphic sexual books in elementary schools encouraging kids to accept homosexual lifestyle as normal. Roman Catholic Church exposed for covering up the actions of pedophile priests. Politics has gone completely crazy. The rise of false prophet movement, explosion of the word of faith and prosperity gospel, the American lie, racial tension unparalleled in our nation. It says that in Matthew 24, that nation will be against nation, that ethnic group, meaning ethnic group, will be against ethnic group. There is no room for that in God's kingdom. Pastors like Billy Graham and Joe Osteen falling away preaching a different gospel. Seeker sensitive movement preachers falling, uh, failing to preach the consequences of sin and the still very relevant wrath of God. Cannot trust anything the media says. Russia invades Ukraine, prompting us for World War III, and you don't even already see it on the news anymore. This is the big one, the Abrahamic Accord, combining the three worlds Abraham faced Judaism, Christian, and Islam. I had uh, friends that were Hebrews. I had friends in prison that were Muslim. But John 14, 6 says there's one way. That's right. One way to reconcile with God. Amen. I met Wiccans that are like I have. They just were really confused. Yeah. Really confused. But there's only one way. Now we got the Great Reset. They're no longer even hiding that they're emphatically moving to a one world order to be controlled by the Antichrist. So the currently condition of the American church is described in 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And from such turn away, what kind of power? In John 1 and 12, the power to become the children of God. In Luke 24, 49, gifted with a power and doomed with power from on high. Acts 1 and 8, but you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses. Acts 4.33, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon all of them. In the churches this morning, as peaceful people worship God, one thing that they need to change has been denied of His relevance, and that is the Holy Spirit. Power. Why do we need the power for? Because it takes power to truly be converted. It takes power for a person to be healed. It takes power for miracles to take place and it takes Holy Ghost firepower to dispatch that demon out of that person. First Timothy 4.1 Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last days some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrite and liars and their consciences are dead. The spirit of the Antichrist was released when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. Remember Satan and his ministers appear as angels as light. They're subtle and crafty, meaning many will not see him coming. Now we're all about the Chosen. We like that show. Let me tell you the danger of the Chosen. As I'm watching it, I'm missing something. I'm missing something big. I'm missing the lie. 
I'm missing what people do when they fall away. Emphatically say, Jesus is God. Let me tell you something. If Jesus, if you don't recognize Jesus as God born on this earth and that he's the only way to reconcile with the heavenly father, if you don't recognize that, if you don't recognize the deity of Jesus, you have not turned your life over to God. It just so happens that there's a moment. We're going to keep watching it. I watch other things I probably shouldn't watch either. Y'all pray for me. Uh, me and Marilyn, we enjoy our, we, we're going to watch the last season of The Walking Dead. I don't know, something about killing zombies. And Daryl, I'm just thinking, everybody needs a Daryl in their life. Y'all say amen. <laughs> I got my Daryl, I got Alan over there. So. <laughs> but there's a common revival in the middle of this famine where churches are dead and the spirit isn't moving. When I tell people, hey man, I, I, when I go reach out to other preachers and say, listen, I got something I don't understand. I'm praying for this young lady and next thing I know she's growling, speaking in a demonic tongue, talking, telling me names of uh, uh, Hindu gods and, and throwing up in the altar and I'm telling her all this stuff. I don't know. I ain't never seen anything like that. They didn't teach that in cemetery. I mean seminary. <laughs> But in Judges 6, 12 through 16, we're going, we're, as, as, as darkness begins to, to crowd and push us in, more and more people are become, going to become demonically influenced. And the only hope we got, the only hope they got to survive is for somebody to allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does. Amen. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now Gideon, come on now. You got to know a little bit about Gideon. Gideon didn't have a real high opinion of himself. You know why? Because Gideon was a nobody. Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? That's a good question. And where are all these miracles which our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us out from the land of Egypt? Down in verse 13, 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours. Oh, hold on, whose might? See, the Holy Spirit needs a willing vessel. Let me tell you, we got dominion, and unless we're willing to take the Holy Spirit out, the Holy Spirit is just going to set still. Everybody saying, why does this happen? Why does that happen? Because of sin, that's why it happened. The reason that it keeps happening, getting worse in our community, because our churches are dead. They've died. They, they bought in their tradition. You shall shave Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. He said, You don't seem to understand. My daddy don't even think much of me. So what was Gideon doing when the angel showed up? He was down in it, and where they threshed, he was threshing the wheat out of, he was trying to get some food. He was hiding from them. The Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites. The Lord is with you. You might have, the Lord saw something in Gideon before he couldn't see something in himself. Listen, I refuse. I refuse to let my three marriages, my 30 months in federal prison, I refuse to let another person's opinion of me keep me from bringing deliverance to broken people. I'm not going to bow down. They can fire me. They can talk about me. They can run me off. I don't care. I'll get out in the middle of the street if I got to. I'm going to tell somebody that Jesus is able regardless of what man said. Amen. Right. Amen. And it tells us in 1 Corinthians, God chooses the weak and the foolish things. Matthew 11, 25, O Father, Lord of heaven, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the child. Like, let me tell you what happens when God just rips you all the way down. When you're laying on that bunk in the county jail and all of your sin, you become like a little child. You just give up. You're humbled. There's nothing more humiliating than having your hands and feet shackled, to, shackled together by your waist. In total control of another man. Thank God that he humbled me. He told him, he said, cut down. He said, listen, you got to get rid. Before we do anything else, you got to get rid of the altar of Baal. And you got to cut down that Asherah pole next to him. So in Gideon's community, Baal was worshipped alongside Yahweh. God called Gideon to get his house in order before forming an army. 
What is the majority of American church worshiping? Let me tell you, Baal represented a good crop. And today the church represents money. Worship, money, wealth, status, worldly influence. And not the Lord God of heaven's army. Baal was the god of fertility. In that capacity, his title was prince, lord of the earth. He was also called the lord of rain and dew. What happens when you have no rain? Anybody ever seen the effect of a few years drought over one area? Nothing grows without rain. Let me tell you, the reason that we're not seeing more miracles and more deliverance church-wide is because the rain of the Holy Ghost has not been allowed to fall. Before the Industrial Revolution, our economies were solely based on agriculture. Y'all realize that, right? Israel worshiped Baal like some American churches worship wealth, position, and power today. It said, cut down the wooden image beside us. This was Asherah. She was the goddess of sexual perversion. Go figure. So we got a church that's worshiping money, and we got a world that's worshiping witchcraft and sexual perversion. Go, go figure that Israel would be dealing with the same thing that we are. But let me tell you what God had in Israel. God had an uncommon, an uncommon warrior that was willing to put together an uncommon army. God in his sovereignty is separating a remnant, a group not afraid to stand against tradition and bow down to the masses like John the Baptist willing to die for the truth. Matthew 10, 34 says, Don't imagine that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I come not to bring peace but a sword. God is getting ready to do surgery on the American church and it's already started. Let me tell you something. The more we talk about casting out demons, the less people want to talk to me about it. I don't care. Let me tell you, I, I don't care. Let me tell you why I don't care. Because I would rather see that one girl get free from those tormenting spirits so I don't have to do her funeral other than have some fake friend that don't understand the Bible that is dead in their tradition. Amen. God's division, separation of those who refuse to lay down tradition and those who value the world's <coughs> wealth above the kingdom. So Gideon puts an army together. The Lord tells Gideon they get 32,000 men. God said, nah, Gideon, that's too many. People will think it's the army that won this battle. You need to whittle it down. So Gideon says, if y'all are afraid to fight, go home. 22,000 left. 22,000. So we're down to 10,000. Now y'all remember these Midianites and Amalekites, they were like hordes of locusts. They couldn't even count. You're talking soldiers, a million man soldier, army. The Lord said, that's too many. Too many. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Lord reduced the army to a mere 300 men. How did he pick the 300 men? The 300 that lapped water like a dog. I mean, think about that. He said, take them to the creek, tell them to drink. All the ones that drink like a human, you got to get rid of them, but you got to keep those that, that ain't even got no manners. God is raising an unusual army. When you see these uh, uh, preachers casting out demons all over the place, they're atheists, they're ex-cons, they've been disregarded, they've been thrown away by the church. They're not afraid to go against tradition. And what's our strategy for victory? God uses unusual men and women. Mary Magdalene, the demon-possessed prostitute. She was the first to see Jesus after the resurrection. The perse persecutor of the church, the Apostle Paul. The sometimes bold, sometimes cowardly. Peter, the denier of Jesus. King David, the disregarded shepherd boy. Possibly illegitimate with serious lust issues that took his friend's wife and then had him murdered to cover up his crime. You know, sometimes I'm praying demons, I say, I cast you out, son of David and the son of Abraham. See, the devil don't like the idea that David was so jacked up, but he was still used by God. You know what the devil don't like, Chaz? He don't like that God uses guys that have been down the wrong road for too long. See, I'm not afraid. I've been, I've walked down the corridors. I've been told you can't talk to this person or that person. I've been told to shut up. You're going to get yourself turned. You're going to get yourself shut in. But a 
were just too stupid to listen or too bold. Something happened. Luke 7, 47. I tell you, her sins, there are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. The reason why God is choosing an army of Gideons, an army of people that lack water like dogs, is because we've seen death. We've been at the end. We've overdosed. We've been to jail. Our life has been threatened. And God has brought us through. I can't help it that I love God more than you do, but I do love God. Why do I love God? Because my sins were me. The enemy has invaded the church in America. It's carefully and subtle attack to compromise and strip the power of the Holy Spirit in our congregation. Personal sin, generational sin, and societal sin, not just in the world, but in our churches, have opened up the masses in our nation to be progressively and aggressively influenced by demons or demonized. The church has come to a place of separation. God is separating those that are willing to go against tradition. The remnant will be led by men and women like Gideon, unusual candidates, men and women who have had many, I mean many, sins forgiven. The redemption is more, their redemption is more significant than most because their sin had destroyed them more than most. We're standing at the beginning of a mighty revival. That's my word from the Lord. A deliverance revival. The spiritual famine has brought about by the church. Compromise is coming to an end. What is the church's response? As the worship team gets ready. Second Chronicles 7, 12 through 14. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence among my people. You see the correlations between Chronicles and what happened in Gideon's time? There's a famine. What do we have to do to get beyond the famine? If my people were called by my name, will humble themselves. That means you got to admit when you're wrong. You, you got to admit that you've really just been half-hearted. You got to admit that you, you ain't reading your Bible during the week. You got to admit you ain't getting up in the morning and praying and seeking God. You got to admit when somebody gives you a prayer request, you, you, you say you're praying, but you don't really pray. You got to admit when the pastor calls a 21 day fast, you make it like a half a day and tap out. You got to admit when you're wrong. You got you to gotta admit. You got to sacrifice yourself. You got to become a living sacrifice for the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Humble yourself. Pray and seek my face. We need to seek the face of the Lord and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attended to their prayers made in this place if we will humble ourselves and seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways and seek God, seek God and seek God collectively. What we've had happen so far in these four years is nothing compared to what we'll see in the next 12 months. We just want to open the altars up. I encourage you, if you need prayer for any reason, we want you to come get prayer. And uh, if you need time in the altar, we want you to come get the altar and pray. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate everyone being here this morning. But now, now the preaching's done, the worship done. Now it's time to con Now it's time to get in touch with God. Anybody got any lost loved ones? Yeah. Amen. Anybody ever think that they're going to get that call? Lost friends, friends out there shooting dope, right? But you ever think that maybe a sure prayer is God's waiting on? You know, intercessory prayer is real. It says if you see a brother committing a sin that's not unto death, pray for that brother. Intercessory prayer is real. So if you got somebody you love that's struggling, come pray for them. If you're sick in your body, come get anointed and pray. If you think you got something hanging around, if you're being woke up at night at terrors and struggling with things, if you open the door and old demon to come back in, come get free this morning. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. 